Okay, now we're introducing part three of the Malta, um, part of the Ice Age Art in Malta talk. And um, what I wanted to cover was just to add a little bit to some of the things that will be said later in the regular uh, tape, which uh, was the resonance in these related ancient sites. Uh, the one of Newgrange, I suddenly started noticing because I kept seeing those threes in the spirals, particularly in Ireland. And I realized it looked like the semicircular canal of the ear. And the individual spirals look like uh, the cochlea of an ear. So um, we're carrying through with all of these natural forms. At the same time, uh, you wonder how much they actually knew about the resonances and the effects on people of sound and the effects on nature as far as sound. I mean, can't, vibration can seem to move things or impact things. So um, that I found interesting. And uh, the next thing I wanted to do was just acknowledge where I got a quote that will start the uh, part three about the sound in the chambers. And it was, uh, I ha came upon, I was finding these things in articles, and I came upon a video called uh, Legacy of a Lost Civilization. And this was um, part, it was put together by a group it's called the Old Temples Study Foundation. That's been around for about 20 years. And they seem to be doing, there are a lot of scientists and people involved that seem to be doing um, the archaeology from the point of view of sound, which is a less well-known and less pursued area that's beginning. And um, the, you can actually get this video on Amazon.com. And I just wanted to recommend that so that you'd know where these what people seem to have produced this information I'll share at the beginning of this. Thanks. So um, that will be exciting. And this is the oracle, oracle room of the hypogeum. And I guess I should, for the sake of the tape, you can see what's written up there, but I will read it as best I can. I usually stumble when I try to read things. But the oracle room in the hypogeum, and you can see the beautiful swirls. And um, we, did a, we did some Om chanting when we were in there. It's pretty amazing. But the oracle room is roughly rectangular and one of the smallest side chambers has the peculiarity of producing a powerful acoustic resonance from any, vocal, any vocalization made inside it. This room has an elaborately painted ceiling consisting of spirals in red ochre and circular blobs, <laughs> I guess is the way they describe it. There is a small niche in what we call the oracle chamber and if someone with a deep voice speaks inside, the voice echoes all over the hypogeum. The resonance uh, in the ancient temple is something exceptional. You can hear the voice rumbling all over. Many archaeoacoustical investigations of prehistoric megalithic structures have identified acoustic resonances as frequencies of 95 to 120 hertz, particularly um, too bad we don't have Alan here because he would understand all this, particularly near 110 to 112 hertz, all representing pitches in the human vocal range. These chambers may have served as centers for social or spiritual events, and the resonances of the chamber cavities might have been intended to support human ritual chanting. Sound scientist Professor Daniel Talma of the University of Malta explains, at certain frequencies you have standing waves that emphasize each and other waves then de-emphasizes e de -emphasize each other. The idea <clears throat> that it was used thousands of years ago to create a certain trance, that's what fascinates me. Findings indicate that at 110 hertz, the patterns of activity over the prefrontal, prefrontal cortex abruptly shifted, resulting in a relative deactivization of the language center in a temporary switching from left to right sided domination, dominance related to emotional processing. People regularly exposed to resonant sound in the frequency of 110 or 111 hertz would have been turning on an area of the brain that biobehavioral scientists believe relates to mood, empathy, and social behavior. Um, 
in the small dreaming cubicles, echoes from the speaking chambers reverberate into a rhythm that is similar to the human heartbeat. Can you imagine if you were there trying to dream and you hear that? And when I was at Stonehenge, that's what I heard. Dum, 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 echoing. Uh, so I think the human heartbeat, that with the chanting, was a very powerful creation to these people. And I think may have had as much to do with how they moved those stones as anything else. Uh, they found an electromagnetic way and a sound vibration that could... And we know that vibration can move heavy objects. So finding... Um, oh, I think this is a repeat. Yeah, yeah sorry about that. But, um, and I do... Oh, I hope I have the handout back there. If not, I'll get it to you, uh, the link to the full article. But I found this really interesting, what the scientists are finding. I mean, they're finding that these were areas where people would chant and do all of the things that, you know, I was seeing. So here's more of the cart ruts. And um, another one of the chambers. Oh, that's what I did. Sorry about that. I thought I had done it twice. Now we're getting to the swan and the vulture. Alan, the whole thing we, the whole thing, well, you know what, I'm going to make you listen to the tape because it's all about the sound and, and how, at a, what it is at a, a deep. I went to the bathroom at exactly the wrong time. Yeah, the deep, it's all right. The deep, the, the male voice, a deep male voice is what would resonate at 110 to 112 megahertz, which is what this was set up to do, this oracle room. And it would sound like a heartbeat in the dreaming chambers, but it could be heard through all of these chambers on all these different levels. And it would have been like um, a ritual voice that could have led the chanting going on there. So it's rather interesting. And they found that that activates, sorry to be repeating, but I guess if people want to hear it again on the tape, they will. It, um, it activates the right brain, meaning the creative, you know, emotional side rather than the verbal side. So, um, and it distinctly sort of, it doesn't dumb down the verbal side, but it deactivates it to the point that your total emphasis is on the, one, one, one might call the intuitive side, the one, that, the, the one that writes song lyrics that reach people, that mean something to everybody who hears them. You know, you would, you do that as a living, for a living. So anyway, what I'm talking about with the cave magic is once again, we're talking about sound and the sky and ancient music from what is sometimes the pole star vega we have three stars that can be the pole star in the north and the one we have now of course is polaris the, the small bear and vega is one and the other one is thuban which is in um, the dragon so you can sort of see what those symbols are but it's also um, it's, it's, it's associated with music and enchantment and people who have a strong vega usually have, are very influential. They move people as orators or as musicians. Vega is very strong on a lot of musicians' charts. And what you know, some showed it as a tortoise. And but the one that they say, that seems to be the original was that there was a vulture holding the lyre. Um, you know, all musical instruments. But what the vulture was, because I remember when I, one of the highlights was seeing this ancient 40,000 year old flute from Germany. And they have, I guess, more than one. They were, and they were all made from swan and vulture bones. They were hollow, so they would, and they would make a certain sound. So they were the sacred musical instruments then from the sacred bones of the swan, which was the shaman, and the vulture, which, I mean, when you hear you know, people say terrible things about vultures, and I don't think humans would have survived without the vultures eating the detritus, you know, eating the dead things, and cleaning up stuff that would eventually harm us. So they do a wonderful service to humanity, but they also provided the magical bones, and thus Vega is the star of, one of the stars. Fulma Halls is also another one, but there are strong stars that indicate um, music and musical ability. And it goes all the way back 40,000 years, too. So all of these... How do you find out where Vega is in the chart? I got uh, the chemical mm -hmm. system. Can you, I mean, is it... Can I look at it online or something? Where is it right now? Well, no. it, it, it's always... Uh, circumpolar, it's always at the top. 
of, you know, it just moves around as the year goes around. So um, I'll have a little map. I think it shows up in the map. Is there a Vega of Emeralds? Um, yeah, Bernadette uses Parans or um, a lot, um, I think the majority actually of, of astrologers who use the full sky um, projected onto the ecliptic, meaning they align it, it what I would consider a Paran. It would show up somewhere in your yeah. chart, yeah. yeah. It would be on the ecliptic somewhere in the chart. It would be, you know, way above it. Are you, but, saying, are you saying it's like a fixed star? Yeah. It yeah, it's a star. Yeah. And it's one of the pole stars, depending on where we are in the thousands and thousands of year cycles. Because at Polaris right now, but Thuban has been the pole star and so has Vega. So it's obviously considered a guide of some sort as well. You did say pole star. I was thinking yeah. <laughs> oh, like Pulsar or something? Yeah, Polestar is a, what it is. Yeah, yeah, that's I, I do tend to <laughs> slur words. Sorry about that. Um, and then I started looking at the tortoise. And once again, if you look at the tortoise shell, it's the sacred six of the feminine. Uh, it has that those beautiful shapes fit together to create the tortoise shell. And that's what um, was the gift from, oh gosh. Was it? I, I believe it was from Mercury to Orpheus to make the liar. But it was, you know, um, I mean, it was Herm, Hermes, you know, to the Greeks, who gave him that gift. And um, so it's quite kind of interesting. And once again, the sixes and the fives we see once again here. And I was trying to figure out. And I thought, you know, there were bee cults all over um, the Minoan civilization and around uh, the Mediterranean at that time, and they were goddess cults. And they were the bee charmers, the beekeepers, like uh, fried green tomatoes had a bee, bee charmer in it, and it was uh, the secret life, wasn't it the secret life of bees? Isn't that the one that was the beautiful one with the sisters? Um, but it was showing this, uh, you know, marvelous art, and, um, Bee venom and bee honey are all healing sources for people, natural healing sources. So, and if you look at the shape of this, happens to be Gigantia, the one on Gozo, the feminine island. But, and you look at my little bee that Elizabeth said, "Oh look!" And I bought it at a little art place in in, in Parkville. But it's the shape of a bee, um, just like the sacred Minoan bee. So. It's, it's rather interesting to see these different feminine shapes. And it's once again the, the five, you know, you see that with the head. Uh, so I just thought that was rather interesting. And now we're getting into Gigantia. And I told you already about a little bit about Gozo and the three sacred hills. These are all more paintings by Francis. And, you, and these, this shows Gozo, the three hill isle is what they call it. And you can see all these later Christian things that were built on top of them. but. Um, and this is, and I thought this was fun because that's uh, Camino, the island that's in between, the small island in between. I think there are like a few inhabitants. It's, it's not terribly populated, and I think it's farmed as well as Gozo. But um, it's on when you take the ferries back and forth. It's the island, and I love the way it looks like the head of a tortoise where you sail through. <laughs> um, and uh, once again, that's a, that's more of his paintings. And I will tell you that it was an entirely different energy when I went to Gozo. Um, and when I went to the um, site of Gigantia, um, Gozo is pastoral, it's farming, it's absolutely beautiful, but it's got a gentle, rolling quality to it. And the sites are beautiful. I think every single cathedral there and every single church is in Our Lady the, you know, they did carry through with the same theme, the Catholic Church did. But um, when I went into this site and we did a meditation, it was like a rose, like a rolling, like a fog energy that came. It was a, it was a more feminine feeling, nurturing, mothering sort of feeling in Gigantia. So to me, and you notice it had the bee sense of my name means bee. I guess I relate to the bee culture a little bit. Deborah in um, Hebrew and 
Melissa and the, and the Greek are mean B. So it's, and I, God knows I've been a busy bee my whole life, so it sort of suits. Um, but anyway, that was, that was the feeling there, and I was, one of the things I wanted to work into the trip is maybe an extension for people who want to stay on one of the little villa farmhouses in the village on Gozo and to really relax with that, that really gentle energy that's there. So, um, just to give you a little sense of that. And I think I got, I have something here. Oh, this was, here you see the spirals again and it starts uh, feeling the same way. Newgrange in Ireland shows some of the residents' qualities. I think I put that a little out of order in the hypogeum and the three vibration, the spirals. And that's um, the Omphalos that's in Delphi. And those were all over the hypogeum and, different, and all the sites in, um, around Malta and Gozo. So they had the, these, and they think that those were, they made, helped with the vibration of the chanting and the oracle, you know, when the, when the ladies would chant the, the, the oracles of Delphi. Well, the oracle was supposedly Apollo, and the, it would be Apollo, whoever would play that role was interpreting what the ladies would into it and entrance and chant, and that follows was used, and they were in these sites as well. So, once again, that same energy feeling. Um, this is Gigantia. You can see the fish was one of the um, engravings there. And um, it's, uh, those were the chambers at the back that you, know, you could sort of, I, I'm thinking they were probably oracular chambers, you know, that there were probably oracles, oracles in those, but I don't know. That remains to be seen. And then, oh, we're getting to the end of the evening. This is the Azure Window, which is off Gozo, which is just beautiful. And there are a bunch of diving sites there. And here is one of the Our Lady Cathedrals. Um, and they were telling me the story of this. I mean, these, this is a very feminine energy. And you can see there's the gentle Mother Mary figure there. Um, and when I, I, I enjoyed it in the church. When I stepped outside, I was like, whoo, this energy and this wonderful um, sense of calm came over me. So it was, that was the top of one of those three sacred hills. Um, anyway, so this is part of that and they said that the, there was a terrible uh, trip that Pope John Paul made um, where the, you know about this, where the, but anyway it was the, the airplane, the, the, the engines caught fire and they said what are we doing? He says Oh, we're near Malta? I want to go to Malta. So he went to this cathedral. He wasn't scheduled to go there. I think he was going to Africa or something. This, is, this island is very close to Tunisia. Tunisia is just west. I mean, it juts up just west of there. So, but still, it's, very, it's closest, I guess, to Sicily. If you're wanting to know how you travel from one place to another, there are ferries that don't take very long to go between the two of them. So there's that, and then... I was just showing more of the feminine, and um, this is this is a phoenix in the church, which I thought was wonderful. Uh, it's, it's rising with the cathedrals, so this was part of the symbology of I think maybe Atlantis rising again, possibly if you want to look at it that way. But it was part of the church chiselings, you know. And then this is, um, uh, and I was talking about Malta lying in the beams of Venus, just like I was describing the Babylonian Venus. And um, one of the lines that they had was uh, so wonderful, where it was Venus blessing the king. And this line was, with what love does Ishtar love the king, my lord, is what the astrologer was saying. And this is one of the paintings of the exhibit, which is Frida Kahlo with, I think it's called, you know, obviously in Spanish, but it's Diego on my mind. And it was her intense love for Diego Rivera. I'm trying to remember what that, there was like a Pluto-Venus conjunction, I think, in her chart or something like that that would make her pretty intense, even though it's in Gemini. It would make her very intensely tied to someone and attached to someone who would inspire her mentally and creatively, I think, was, would be how I would look at it. So it sort of fit into this whole Venus feeling. And then we're getting on to Hajarim and Imnidra. Imnidra is a, it was very distinctly um, an, an astronomical, astrological site. So, um, and Hajarim is the sister site, or the, I would say the brother site to that, 
Hajarim is the one that's most developed now. And it's another really beautiful place. But in Nidra, you can see the same, like Stonehenge and um, other hinges, you see the, the rocks that, where they did the observation and even the interior um, looked like that by it. You know, there's a blue grotto that's right by it. And this is the view when you go down to M. Nidra from, I'm sorry, to M. Nidra from Hajarim, the little island that's sacred off, off the coast. I think it's now a military thing, so you can't go to it, but it's, um, you know, quite, quite a beautiful site. And you can sort of see the Stonehenge look to it. And oh, here's one of the altars at Hajarim, which I thought was beautiful. Somebody put an offering on it. And that's what they think it looked like. A lady spent many years um, recreating every stone and fitting it together, and that's apparently what it looked like. It's, um, I think that's in, I'm almost positive it's in the handouts too. It gives you the, the um, address you go to, and the Malta Times published this, and you get actually get a full video of it in the round with, the, with it showing you how she has done this. And it's an interview with her and Maltese, <laughs> which is rather interesting. And um, you can pick up a lot of English, a lot of Italian. Like I said, they, they incorporated all these languages, but there's this beautiful, very ancient sounding language like the Celts have um, that had to be, you know, from the original ones. Uh, and here's in Nigra, and it's a solar temple as well. You can see where in the summer solstice, this particular rock is, and, you know, um, the light hits it in the winter solstice, it hits that opposite rock, and then at the equinoxes, it goes, it makes a straight line through there. So it's rather interesting to, to see how it's aligned as well. So this is, once again, with all the art is the astrology, astronomy, the sky. And you can see all these little holes. It seemed to mean something counts or, or stars or something it indicated. And here you can see an interior sort of hinge that they were and there are little windows you can see that they must have had a certain star or, uh, or the sun or something would be at that particular point at a certain time of year and they were observing that. And that's the um, exterior one under a tent, but that's an exterior um, little astronomical observatory that they had there. Uh, and this is just what you could pick up in the back. Wendy's two incredible books with the CDs that tell you more about the sky. And she'll tell you a lot about Vega and I'll just look up your chart and see where it's aligned if you want. Elizabeth or I, either one, can do it. Find out if you have a Paran de Vega and also find out where it lies and, you know, where it is by what I would call Paran 2, meaning down the longitudinal line from where it is in the sky. So... Yeah, it's, and if you have a solar fire, you can just go into reports and find out. Yeah. Find it. It's real quick. This is Francis. This is a picture he had on his Facebook page of the trip he's on now, or I think he's just completed it. And that's um, Gigantia, you know, a beautiful uh, picture of, of, I'm not even sure that's Gigantia, but it's one of the ancient sites on there. And here's, that's his book, and uh, Island of Dreams, which is really a fun read if you like, like seeing what the what the Maltese believe is their connection to Atlantis. It's, it's an interesting read. And he tells his story. And he's on Facebook, you can look him up. He's Ramthus Temple Dreamer, <laughs> if you want to look him up. And I think Ramthus is the, character, the main character in his book. And then just to let you all know, if you happen to be night owls or if you happen to be... As an addendum and follow-up to the uh, Malta lecture, I did mention that there seemed, when I looked at some of the stones at Imnidra, the astronomical site, that there seemed to be these very deliberate counts with little drilled holes in some of the prominent stones. And so you'll see a picture here of that. And um, what I discovered in the recording um, that I made reference to um, that was done by the um, people studying the Maltese sound effects in the different sites was that um, they also discovered that since this is an equinox based, aligned, I should say, site, that um, the numbers seem to be a count of days between the equinox and settings of certain stars that would then 
be hidden by the light of the sun for a number of days. And this count seemed to be between each setting of different prominent stars. And it, what was interesting about that was that um, the count seemed to fit when I rolled it back to about 1500 BC, um, getting closer to what, what the equinox would have uh, been then. So at the time they would have designed this. So that was fascinating. And then the uh, final thing that I wanted to share was to make something available to the people locally in Kansas City who were interested and attended the first Malta lecture and that we'll have a follow-up talk and video um, on July 14th, that's a Sunday, at 2.30 p.m. And for information uh, as far as directions to where this will be and um, other information you might want to know, you can contact me, that's Debbie at Debbie Kyle Astrologer, that's D-E-B-B-I-E-K-E-I-L, astrologer, all one word, dot com, or you can call me at 816-774-4514. Hope to see you there, and if you don't happen to be in the area, um, we will see about getting a recording and more information to those of you interested in a multi-trip. Thank you.